My name is Doug Iman. I am the director of the Writing and Rhetoric PhD at George Mason University. I am also the senior editor and publisher of a journal called Kairos, a journal of uh, rhetoric, technology, and pedagogy, which has been publishing peer-reviewed online, uh, an online peer-reviewed journal publishing since 1996. Uh, and in that journal, we, we require our authors to uh, utilize all of the means of available persuasion that the web affords. So we won't publish something that's just straight text. It has to include design as a feature of the argument, which is often a challenge, but also leads to some pretty innovative work. So I'm very excited about the kind of work that we do there and how it might link into the, the conversation we're going to have here. Uh, in terms of my areas of expertise, uh, digital rhetoric is probably the, the key. Uh, I also do quite a bit of work uh, with uh, video games, uh, video game rhetorics, and how we can think about video games and writing studies and writing uh, video games as writing platforms in particular. And so that's kind of where, where I'm at at the moment. Read my book. <laughs> I have a pretty uh, lengthy, not not super lengthy, but lengthyish sec section on what constitutes digital. Um, for the purposes of uh, like working with the idea of the digital in context of digital rhetoric and digital literacy, um, I tend to think about how how what we work with can be represented as discrete units, right? So the idea of digital is that you have discrete units that when put together quickly enough appear to be uh, connected, right? Um, and it, one of my colleagues, uh, Angela Haas, always reminds us that, that you know, if you think about digital and going back in time, digital relates to digits, which are the hand, right? The fingers. And the idea that each one is separate and can do things separately. And I think that's really helpful for keeping us grounded and connected to the idea that the digital is not separate from the physical, right? That there's always a, a component of embodiment that often, especially in the early days of, of the web, people were like, well, you know, on the internet, nobody knows your ex, right? Because there is this attempt to say, when you're doing work and when you're communicating digitally, you can divorce the body and you can divorce who you are um, physically from what you're representing digitally. But... Well, that's a nice idea in some ways. It's actually not true. Uh, so kind of reminding ourselves that there's this connection to the body, I think is really, really important. But on a technical level, it's just like when you have discrete units as opposed to a continuous flow, then you have the digital. Um, kind of in everyday parlance though, I mean, the digital constitutes all of the devices that we're using connected to the networks that make them uh, speak to each other and make a lot of the communication practices that we have now possible, right? So I would say that it, the digital in general um, constitutes this interaction of the infrastructure, the networks, the tools, right? Both the hardware and then the software and applications. And when you put all those together, you have a kind of digital ecology, right? Um, for me, I'm really interested in the infrastructure part in particular and how the networks work and how we connect um, some countries really use cell phones and mobile devices primarily as their way of connecting. And some countries like the US, for instance, uses a lot more actual cable and connection, uh, fiber optic cable. We do a lot more of that than other countries. So thinking about how the, how the connections work is also like really important to thinking about what constitutes the digital. It's about the connections, not just the devices. I think that digital literacy is the, well, there are different kinds of literacies, right? Obviously we have kind of foundational literacies and we have critical literacies and there are social technical literacies and cultural literacies. So there are lots of different ways of articulating literacy just by itself, even before we get into these distinctions between literacy and rhetoric. Uh, for my purposes, I tend to think of literacies as the skills and abilities and practices and knowledge thereof that allow for um, communicating digitally, right? So a digital literacy means that you have the skills to do the communication and then digital rhetoric is how you use them effectively toward a particular moment of persuasion uh, to inform, to persuade, to entertain, whatever your end goal is, right? So the digital literacy part is a requirement of digital rhetoric. You have to have the literacy and the skill sets in order to be effective as a rhetorician in the digital, in the digital realm. Now these, these digital literacies might take different forms, 
So for instance, um, you may be able to use web design as a digital literacy, or you may simply be able to use uh, a particular app or a particular, um, a particular way of using the technology, right? So a, a literacy skill might include video editing, right? And, vid and taking video and working with it and turning it into something useful. So these are the kind of basic skills, but it, beyond just the basic skills, a knowledge of how to effectively use these, I think, moves from foundational to critical literacy. Um, I also would point to Stuart Selber's work as a really good way of thinking through what constitutes different kinds of literacies within a digital realm. Um, and of course, there's a lot of really good work on digital literacy that then grounds and helps us better understand how to effectively turn our skills and applications into um, elements of persuasion, how to move from a literacy-based uh, practice to a rhetorical-based practice. And that really just means that thinking about audience purpose and context and putting into play the kind of rhetorical practices and uh, theories using digital literacy skills. Methodologically, one of the affordances is that we can capture a lot more than we, than we could without the digital. So we can collect a lot more data and we can work with that data in really interesting ways. We also have more tools now to analyze and um, parse out that data and make it a little easier for us to work with it and do interesting things with it. So in terms of affordances, I think we also have a problem with constraints in that we can get too much data. Right? So the digital allows for a kind of fire hose approach to collecting data, but then that means that we have issues with trying to decide where we set the boundaries, what kind of discernment we need to use, how we're going to uh, determine which parts of the data we're going to analyze and how we're going to do that. I also think that the digital, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, sometimes uh, gives us the impression that we can divorce the physical or the embodied from the digital which again, I think is a mistake, right? And something that we need to keep in mind when we're doing work with digital rhetoric or, or with digital methods uh, in terms of research. Um, so I think those are kind of the, the key, key elements. And in terms of producing the research and publishing it, the digital obviously gives us a lot more opportunities to think through uh, questions of interaction as a mechanism for publication. Uh, thinking about that relationship between design and argument that I think the digital allows for in ways that are much more robust than our kind of traditional print-centric uh, modes of publication. But at the same time, at this point, almost all modes of publication are digital publication, even if the main vehicle is uh, the printed word, right? The production practices are digital themselves. So we can't really divorce ourselves at this point from the digital. Almost all of our research is, is digital. Uh, at the same time, one of the things I would point out methodologically is that it, it's important to, to remember that, especially now, a lot of the work that's happening in, our, in the field of writing studies is looking at this idea of multimodality. Um, and so we want to be careful not to conflate multimedia and multimodality, because multimodality is much broader than simply the digital. So if you look at Jody Shipka's work, for instance, um, you get really great examples of how multimodality works in analog and physical spaces. When we look at like maker spaces where you combine the digital and the physical, you're getting into a much more robust arena. And so I think it's important for us to keep in mind these kind of um, not to conflate things that seem to be easily connected, like saying like, oh, multimodal is all multimedia, right? So I, th I think that's the digital has all these capacities to help us do work, but we also have to be critically aware of where the, those capacities might, um, might prevent us from seeing how some of the actual work takes place if we divorce the digital from the physical or the embodied. A pretty big question. Uh, <laughs> I think one of the things that's pretty interesting is to look at what's happening in the uh, like K-12 world to see where uh, things are coming in and what the expectations are. I think that uh, we're a little behind in some respects in higher education, right? So students now in the K-12 world are using uh, digital practices to create um, PowerPoints and Prezi's and videos and using digital means of production 
that we don't even really engage as, as deeply in our, for instance, our, in our writing classes the comp or composition classes, um, although we sometimes do. Um, and I think that, you know, more and more the norm is for students in uh, across K-12 and higher education to be using digital systems to connect to each other as students and to faculty. And whether that's through a learning management system like Blackboard or Canvas, um, which are more and more in use even at the K-12 level, which is something that I found somewhat surprising. Um, I was talking to a high school teacher there, like, well, we're a, we're a Google campus, right? And so everything happens through Google. So I think that there's a, a digital mediation that's happening in education right now that is happening across all levels. And I think we're still wrestling with how well that works and what it gets us. Um, there's a lot of research on that, of course. I'm not saying that we're not looking at it, but I think that we're in a moment of transition that really requires us to take some time to do the kind of critical reflection on what are we getting out of this and what are we losing? Um, and you can look even at, at, at the questions of like, okay, we're not teaching cursive anymore, right? Or handwriting. And what does that mean for our students in terms of their their cognitive development for what they can do. And of course, there's a lot of argument about whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, and also whether to teach coding. Uh, how early do you start teaching uh, literacies of coding or computational literacies or algorithmic literacies? Um, and of course, there's a distinction between a literacy, uh, computational algorithmic literacy, and a kind of skill set that like a professional would need to, to compute or to create programs, right? So programming and programmatic literacies like computational literacies are, are really different things. So a, a, a mechanism or a way of thinking is different from a way of making uh, in some cases. I mean, they're related, but they can also be teased apart. And so I think this is where, we're, where, where a lot of the really interesting work these days is happening, is that trying to figure out like, how does this stuff work? I often have to remind myself like, you know, uh, the web is not that old in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's quite a bit younger than I am, for instance. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, our students have grown up with it. And even in their growing up, they've seen massive changes in speed and capacity in the general best practices and what you can do in terms of interactivity and audio and video. We're seeing a lot more audio and video than there used to be because we continually improve our abilities to both uh, store data and stream it, right? And so I think that's why we're seeing a a lot more, um, a lot more of that work happening in the educational space, where we're saying like, okay, now we can actually do this stuff. It's not something that's relegated to uh, professionals, and it has such a high bar for learning how to do it. We can actually teach students at any level to start doing some of this kind of communicative work in digital spaces, and it, it's really, really interesting to see what that means for what these students will do with it too, right? Because they're growing up with a different version of like what's possible. You know, when I was younger, this this stuff wasn't wasn't like we didn't have cell phones to to date myself a little bit, right? So imagine a world without cell phones. It's a completely different world, right? And the things we can now do with cell phones blow away what we could do with the earliest computers. So as we continue to see how this how this moves, you know, we're probably moving toward the singularity at a rapid pace, right? We're all going to be part of the computer eventually, if we're not already. Um, but that's going, to, that's going to really drive a lot of the research practices that we have and what we're interested in seeing. Like, what does this mean for different cohorts of students who are coming up with different kinds of digital literacies because the literate possibilities are different for them based on what's possible, what's been done, what's been made? Um, I also think it's really, really interesting to look at differences in, across cultures and in, uh, um, in different countries, right? So I've been looking at the histories of digital practice and how they grew up in China versus the US, for instance. And in the US, we had these bulletin board systems. You would dial up um, the old, you know, the modem sound and you'd be like, oh, I'm gonna connect. And then you would play a game or you would or you would chat with people online. This is like pre-internet. Well, the internet was around, but the web was not, right? And so the way a lot of people connected was discreetly connecting to a network through the modem, uh, not connected to an internet, but connecting to a hub, which was a bulletin board system right, or the old AOL system, um, the, the millions of, you know, AOL CDs we got, and then like, what do we do with all these? They make great coasters, or, you know, you can make sculptures out of them now. Um, 
and and it's really interesting to me that the the experience of uh, in the U.S. is that the the textual production was there, but was not um, extensive, right? So chats were not really lengthy. There was a lot of short interactions happening. In China, they had a, a kind of practice that they called I think it's called filling up the well. And the idea was when they would connect in their BBSs, uh, there was a kind of competition to see who could write the most. Right? And so they would actually produce massive amounts of text in the shortest amount of time in order to be like the person who could write the most. And I think this actually informs the kind of literate practices that we see because even now when I compare like what's happening in the internet in China versus here, I see a lot more audio and video here. I mean, there's plenty there, don't get me wrong, it's definitely there, but I see a lot more textual production in the Chinese internet space than I see in, in the American internet space. And a lot of it is in um, fascinating work in, in the production of these like short stories. They do serialized stories and then people get hooked and then they have to start paying for the next chapter. Um, so there's a huge industry of producing these like these, these texts. Um, uh, a guy named Michael Hawkins uh, has done like really great work on this. So I, if you're interested in seeing like how that works, I'd recommend taking a look at his work. Um, yeah, but it's really interesting to me to see like differences in culture, differences in practices, and then if you look across a different, uh, different kind of international spaces, uh, um, like in Africa, for instance, most of the internet connectivity is via cell phone, as I noted, right? So it's cell phone towers, cell phone devices. And that's a really different model for like having uh, tools for writing because the tools for writing, if they're a cell phone, give you a really different model for what that writing looks like based on the capacity of the cell phone to support writing. And so again, you're gonna see a lot more audio and video because it's a lot easier to produce audio and video writing on a cell phone than it is to produce text. Right? So I think these are, you know, I, I kind of wandered away from your original question about, you know, the educational space, but just thinking about what happens here is different from what happens elsewhere and, and doing some of those comparisons might be really, um, I think is really interesting space for doing research. Another small question. Uh, yeah, so I think digital literacies research, I think there's a lot of space. Uh, again, because we have such a limited amount of time that this, these uh, literate practices have been developed, that, that means that there's a lot of work still to be done to understand how they work, right? I think there's plenty of work to be done on audio and video and especially interaction. Interaction design is a space that I think is really interesting because it's happening primarily in technical communication, user experience design, um, and a little bit less, uh, at least from my perspective, in, in the world of literacy studies. And so I'd like to see more of that kind of um, overlap between the technical communication, interaction design, information design, and user experience worlds, and kind of the studies of literacy and literate practices. Um, I'm not saying it's not there. There are certainly folks that are doing that, but I think there's a lot of really good opportunity to make connections across some of these disciplines that have slightly different perspectives on what constitutes a literate practice and what's, what's needed in order to be most effective in communicating, communicating these things. And there's also differences, uh, you know, going back to this question of uh, different cultures and different practices. If you look at how uh, kind of European versions of writing studies are approaching, like how do we communicate in these spaces, it's a little different from uh, the American version or the Canadian version uh, which is a little different from the Asian version, which is actually quite different from these other versions. Um, and so looking across global spaces to see uh, how literate practices develop in different countries and different cultures, I think, is probably one of the most important spaces to be, to be like, as new directions or things that really need to be, to be taken up. And I, I, I want to kind of end by saying, like, one of the other things uh, that's been on my mind lately is is thinking about not forgetting or not dismissing earlier work because I think there's a tendency especially with folks who do work with digital technologies or internet technologies to assume that the newer is better and that the old is outdated right that, okay so we don't we don't have dial-up modems anymore so we shouldn't go back 20 years and see what people were saying about how those literate practices happen because the technology has changed but if you actually go back and read some of the earlier works, there's a lot of good theoretical uh, grounding and frameworks that I, I worry that we lose simply because we think it's, it's outdated. And some of that work is actually really not outdated because the theoretical 
frameworks are still good, right? Or the 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 questions that were raised about how we should or could study some of this um, are still accurate questioning, like modes of questioning. Um, so this is just my my uh, my pitch to to the PhD students to like don't start with like 2010 as your starting point as like the only stuff worth looking at. Go back and look at the stuff. Uh, I'm particularly, I, I'm looking lately at, at stuff from like 1989, 1988, 1990, 1991 in computers and writing. There's, there were a slew of edited collections published then, and there's some really good stuff there. There's also a lot of digital literacy work published in the mid 90s that is also really, really useful. Um, so even just for having that background to know what's happened, what's come before, uh, so that you can build a really solid foundation to move forward, uh, I think is important. Uh, especially for, for, for graduate students doing research.